Spider-Verse 2 is known as Spider-Geddon, and it was at this point that they decided to put the focus primarily on Miles Morales, giving him a chance to show off how cool he could be and go on his own adventures. So today we're gonna bring you Spider-Geddon, AKA Spider-Verse 2. It's Earth-138. The streaks in New York are quiet, well, sort of. The big man is thrown into the alleyway, clad in biker clothes, slamming into the ground, and his attacker follows up closely behind. I got two rules, Thunderstrike! And from the shadow steps Spider-Man. Jean vest, baseball bat, and metal spikes coming out of his head. This is Spider-Punk, the anarchist of the Spider-Verse. Spider-Punk doesn't like gods or monsters. The massive man on the ground fits both those descriptions. Thunderstrike tries to struggle to his feet, but gets a swift kick from Spider-Punk's high tops. Leaning in, Spider-Punk informs Thunderstrike, You better leave, but your hammer is staying here, or we're gonna have a little Ragnarok and roll. Before he could say a word, a blast of energy snaps out, hitting Thunderstrike. Light fills the alleyway, and where he once lay is only a pile of ash. Spider-Punk backs away, looking over his shoulder. That also sends a message, he quips, before him floats a strange being in a purple suit. Energy crackling out of his hands. It is Kang, the Conglomator. Raising his bat, Spider-Punk prepares for battle, yet Kang is not who he thinks he is. Spider-Punk simply stares, so Kang tells him his future. In the year 2099, Kang Co. owns all likeness rights to Spider-Punk's image, and with this, he makes millions in merchandising. Everything but the comics. The comics don't really sell that well. Realizing that he has become a sellout in the future, and it isn't even his fault, Spider-Punk becomes enraged. You're a dead man, he screams. Yet Kang pays him no attention and continues his monologue. He intends to take Spider-Punk back with him to the future. While pictures and movies are great, the real thing would make him billions. And Spider-Punk glares. You and what army? And as if on cue, more strange lights begin to fill the alleyway and Kang is surrounded by Spider-Punk looking egg things. The short-armed, egg-bodied Spider-Punks leap at our hero, who starts swinging his bat for all that he's worth. There are too many, though, and he's quickly overwhelmed by the strange creatures. Kang begins to laugh. This is why people love Spider-Punk. The struggle, the fighting against overwhelming odds. And suddenly, the creatures go flying and Spider-Punk emerges, his costume torn and one eye exposed. He thwips away, reaching for his cell phone as the creature begins to give chase. He's gonna need backup. Across the city, Captain Anarchist is fighting the Annihilation Wave for putting on a surf concert in Harlem. Something about those bugs and surf music, I, I don't know. Spider-Punk is on his way and he needs the tape. Captain Anarchist is shocked. The tape? And Spider-Punk needs the atom bomb. Dropping next to his friend, Spider-Punk prepares to fight alongside Captain Anarchist, but they don't have to. Right behind him are the strange egg creatures who immediately start fighting with the Annihilation Wave bugs. With their moment of rest, Captain Anarchist hands the tape over to Spider-Punk but is knocked away by one of the creatures as they're thrown into him. Spider-Punk reacts quickly with his webbing shooting out to stomp it, but not before it's down the throat of one of the bugs from the Annihilation Wave. Jumping to the creature, Spider-Punk pries it out of his mouth like he's a dog. Finally getting the tape, Spider-Punk and Captain Anarchist are greeted by the arrival of Kang. Spider-Punk warns Anarchist about Kang, but the future businessman looks at Anarchist with contempt. He has no need for Captain Anarchist. The man isn't profitable in the future. No one cares about him. And with that insult, Captain Anarchist leaps to attack Kang, hoping to give Spider-Punk some time as he whips away. Racing through the city on his web lines, Spidey finally arrives on a rooftop, and sitting there is his mohawked friend, Robbie. Spidey's gonna need Robbie, who angrily knocks away the tape that Spider-Punk is holding out. He's out, and he's not helping anymore. Kang arrives in the street below, and breaking away from his glaring argument with Robbie, Spider-Punk leaps down to meet him. He can't beat Kang, but he's not going down without a fight. The two begin their epic battle, and on the rooftop, Robbie watches before finally putting the tape into his Walkman. The music fills his ears. His eyes begin to flash green. The roar fills the night air as a massive figure leaps off the building, its fist coming straight down with gigantic force onto Kang's body. Spider-Punk cheers as Punk Hulk and Kang begin to fight it out. Kang's energy blasts begin to bounce off the Hulk's body, having little effect. Hulk grabs Kang, swinging him around, his body battering into the walls and street around them. Finally broken and defeated, Kang lays there. Spider-Punk asks, standing over his defeated enemy with a now slightly calmer Hulk. Why me? Why not Captain Anarchist? In the future, Anarchist died an old man that no one paid attention to anymore. But Spider-Punk, you died young, like every great bankable star. And with those final ominous words, Kang disappeared. 
Glaring at the spot where he once was, Spider-Punk finally turns to his green friend, but the two don't get to celebrate long as new energy fills the streets. Before them, a blue portal opens up and through its steps, Mayday Parker, Spider-Woman. Something big is happening in the multiverse. Something that needs them all together again. Spider-Punk hesitates for a moment and then steps through into the spider get -in. Earth 14512. Class has just ended. The teacher is making sure that the students remember their homework for the weekend. Happy to finally be finished for the day, Penny Parker is trying to get her things together. She's interrupted, however, by a new student who tries to introduce herself, Addie Brock. The white-haired girl extends her hand. Penny doesn't shake it. And she lets the girl know that if she wants to be cool, she shouldn't be seen talking to Penny. What Addie really wants, though, is to know if the rumors are true. Is Penny the pilot of the spider suit? The protector of the city. Penny doesn't want to talk about that and runs out of class. But the new girl, Addie, follows her seemingly angered by Penny's refusal to talk. You think that you're so special, but you're not, Penny finally gets away, hearing one last yell from over her shoulder. Everyone is afraid to tell you what they really think because your father died. And with those parting words, Penny is gone. Back in the Parker residence, Penny walks in on her aunt and uncle discussing something called the Sim Engine, and the UN wanted to test it out. When questioned about it, Aunt May and Uncle Ben changed the subject, quickly asking about how her day was. Am I special, she asks. Her aunt and uncle reassure her that she is special. That's why she can pilot the spider suit, yet she's just one part of the team. And they're doing everything that they can to make sure that she's not out there on her own. But they won't elaborate on what they mean, and with that, Penny storms away in frustration, locking herself into her room. Later, May is working on the spider suit, trying to repair some of its weapons, while Penny doodles anime characters on the arms. Glancing over her shoulder, Penny suddenly sees Addie Brock. Walking through the hallways in a combat suit, slipping away from her aunt, Penny follows behind the new student. Suddenly peeking around the corner, Penny is shocked to discover a new combat mech, the Venom suit. Penny glares as she sees Uncle Ben talking to Addie, praising her connection with the Sim engine in the Venom suit. Her anger is interrupted, though, when the alarms begin to blare and running through the hallway, Penny quickly gets back into the spider suit, ready to deploy. Later, the spider deploys into the city to meet with the Morbius creature, a strange tentacled monster that is sucking energy out of the city. Penny jumps into action, whipping the creature's tentacles from the power sources that they are attached to. Her aunt and uncle giving her tactical advice over the comms. Citizens of the city run in fear as the combat armor and creature are locked into battle. But Penny begins to lose power as the creature's tentacles begin to wrap around the spider suit. Now completely drained, the suit is thrown away, and Penny is sitting angrily in the dark. She needs backup, and enter Addie in the Venom suit. The new mecha moves in fast, arm blades slicing through the Morbius tentacles. Uncle Ben is ordering her to stop. They want Morbius alive, but the suit, the Venom suit, it's not responding, and it's moving as if it's on its own. In the cockpit, Addie begins to hear voices. We can't go back. They'll kill us, it tells her. Wires begin to move throughout the cockpit, sliding and wrapping around Addie. We are now in control. Addie is no longer responding, and Ben and May can't shut down the suit from the control room, so they have no choice. Venom looks up as the chopper glides closer, and May descends from a ladder. Getting inside of the cockpit, May is shocked to see Addie. The suit is alive now, with its wires trapping her. Addie seems barely there anymore, her eyes a blank glaze. The voice that is issued from her throat isn't hers, and May tries to help, but the wires begin to engulf her as well. She screams for Ben over the radio, but then all is silent. Ben has managed to get power back to the spider suit. Springing back up, Penny locks into combat with the Venom suit, trying to save her aunt. The suit is more animal than machine now, with a long tongue of wires sliding out of its mouth. Venom is faster and more heavily armed, and Spider tries to stop it, but she can't. Venom pins her down, and the spider is cracked and dented with each blow. Addie is gone. May is gone. We are Venom! The words come out of the suit, and Penny stares in horror, but May managed to fix the web shooters earlier that day, and they work now. Pinning Venom to the wall, Spider gets up, ripping the cockpit out of the Venom. But there's nothing there but wires. No pilot, no Aunt May. Later, Ben brings Penny a coffee in her room, and he tells her that what happened is not her fault. They can grieve together. Suddenly the room is full of light as a portal opens up against one wall and from it emerges Peter Porker. The multiverse needs all of the spider people that it can get, and Uncle Ben knows that the universe needs her. So Penny steps through the portal with the pig. On an unknown earth, in a bar called Stacy's, Ben Parker is parked at the counter. 
He stares down at the dead phone in his hands, and next to him a man is wed to the counter. Struggling against his bonds, the bartender is a friendly sort, offering to charge the phone while he hands Ben a beer. The criminal tries to struggle some more and is rewarded with a blow from Ben's fist. Drinking his beer, Ben tells the bartender his story. You see, some time ago, Ben has fallen while coming out of the subway. His heart had given up on him, and he was lying down on the paint that spilled when he dropped it. His breath had come in gasps as the people of New York simply walked around him, completely ignoring someone in distress. And a little while later, Peter is watching a video of Spider-Man webbing up Jameson as he sits in the doctor's waiting room. In the office, Ben and May have just heard awful news. But should they tell Peter? May doesn't want to. Let's just let him be a kid for a little while, she suggests. Another time jump. Peter is outside the pharmacy while Ben learns that his health insurance won't cover his heart medication. Instead, he gets some pain medication and exits the pharmacy to discover that Peter isn't where he left him. Peter can't help himself and is posing as Spider-Man for people with their phones. This is unknown to Ben, though, who starts to walk down the street, not seeing the man shadowing him quickly or the gun that he pulls. The shots, they echo throughout the street, and the blood transfusion from Peter saved Ben's life. It was some time later before Ben discovered that it also gave him powers. That was when Ben knew that Peter was actually Spider-Man. He wasn't posing that day. Ben began to help Peter, stepping in to save him from the wrecker. The old man doesn't really know much about the superhero business, but he's tough. He can put up a fight. They argue. Is it right for them to stop the wrecker? And Ben learns that he was just defending his neighborhood from the developers who were trying to put people out of their homes. Peter counters. But what if he hurt someone doing it? The two begin to work together, stopping villains while Peter tries to decide on what their names should be. Apparently, Spider-Ben and Petey was two on the nose. The two worked well together, fighting crime, even taking part in the big spider war. And then it all went wrong. Itsy Bitsy Spider, the grave red. The dirt shook and trembled as Ben punched his way out of the grave, gasping for breath. He didn't have time to rest. He needed to save Petey. The rain fell as the lightning flashed over the house in the distance, and Ben Parker stalked his way forward, thoughts of stealth and secrecy gone. Inside, the sounds of Ben's fists impacting with the Craven the Hunter's face could be heard over the rain and the thunder. The questions didn't matter, and they only served as punctuation for each blow. Ben is finally interrupted as Petey, still groggy from the drugs, tells him that Craven fed him. He hugs Ben, scared. This is over. We're done, Ben told him. But Petey argued. Why does he get to decide that? Then Petey sees Craven, his face a bloody mess and shocked and horrified at what Uncle Ben did. Petey picks him up and he carries him out. But he tried to kill me, Ben whispers, not understanding his nephew. Ben has finished his story and his beer. The phone is finally charged with a few parting words. Ben exits the bar. You never know how long you have in this world. And Ben knows that better than anyone. Petey and May may be long gone. But he's still here. He stares down at the phone, a sad smile playing over his face as he sees pictures of him and Petey. On another unknown earth, Harry Osborne has arrived. The red sports car parked in front of the massive tower that is Oscor Plaza. Inside, security informs his father that he is on the premises. In his chambers, Norman watches the cameras that fall from the ceiling like webs. In the lobby, Harry is greeted by security, and they take his arm and they escort him up. He doesn't argue. In the elevator, now he waits for them to push the button for the penthouse. Then his hands begin to move quickly, pulling out his concealed tasers. The guards fall from the single shock, with the last taking a knuckle duster to the chin. Harry disregards his jacket and steps out of the elevator. He needs something before he meets his father. Back at his chambers, Norman questions why he even bothers with security, his forearms flexing as he climbs down from his platform. The letter that Harry received from his friend Peter told him everything that his father was doing. It told him how to stop him. It told him where the kobold armor was. And donning it now, the mask locked in a wide-toothed grin of the trickster kobolds of myth. Harry slipped through the building silently, finally arriving in his father's inner chamber. Beneath the mask, Harry's eyes go wide. His father, clad in armor, descends from the ceiling, his forearms clinging to the walls. But that doesn't surprise Harry. What does is the wrapped cosmic cube in the center of the room. The broken key to reality that does little more than show images of what might have been. And the images of Peter Parker as the amazing Spider-Man. Norman Osborn as the villain Green Goblin. And Harry eventually taking over for him. The two fight, father and son trading blows, but even in this enhanced armor, Harry is no match for his father's strength and he falls to the ground beaten and bloodied. Norman stands over him, triumph on his face, 
Harry's foot comes up, smashing his father in his uh, egg sack and doubling him over. With his last burst of strength, Harry fires a shot from his wrist launcher, the round going over Norman's shoulder, shattering the cosmic cube. In the room is every version of Norman standing there at once, his years of planning ruined by a single moment. Harry's last images is him and his friend Peter, or a version of them, the building that explodes. But Norman isn't dead. The explosion has sent him into the cube, into the very webs that hold the multiverse together, and this is what he wanted. This is how it should have ended. Suddenly, a web line hits his back and he screams, NO! as he is pulled away by none other than Spider-Punk. And back on Earth 616, Dr. Otto Octavius has taken up residence in San Francisco. Once, he was one of Spider-Man's greatest villains. Then for a short time, he became Spider-Man. But not just Spider-Man, he was the superior Spider-Man, doing the things that the true hero couldn't bring himself to do. Since returning as a clone of his younger self, Otto has decided to try and become an even better hero, the superior octopus. The bus travels down the street on a quiet night, and with that, the conversations have ended by a shovel being thrown through the front window. Shocked, the driver swerves, and the bus begins to tip over. The roof is suddenly peeled away, and the patrons are shocked to see the supervillains Digger, Dance Macabre, Skyne, Waxman, and the Brothers Grimm. The villains begin to collect everyone's valuables as they're attacked, but the superior octopus arrives on the scene, his arms throwing the Brothers Grimm away, while the Digger is blinded by his ink shooters. The villains don't even stand a chance. Otto stands already triumphant as his mechanical arms do most of the work. He had prepared for this fight by modifying the arms to fight each of these villains' powers, and they were quickly defeated. Instead of arresting them though, Otto makes them an offer. Work for him as his agents in protecting the city, and they will earn more than they could ever steal. They agree and Otto heads back into the night. Returning to his base just as the sun comes up, he doesn't have much time though, and he quickly changes. When not superheroing, Otto is Professor Tolliver at Horizon University. All of his crime-fighting and supervillain past can't prepare Otto for what's about to happen, though. Running into his ex-girlfriend. Well, actually, it's Peter Parker's ex-girlfriend from when Otto was living inside of Peter Parker's brain. Otto still has feelings for her, but since they've never actually dated, it's hard for him to work with her every day. Later that night, the superior octopus has just managed to save some civilians from a bridge collapsing. While a hero now, Otto still finds it difficult to get away from his former supervillain ways, and it doesn't help when he's questioned by the local authorities about his past. Returning to his base of operations, Otto is surprised to find Arnim Zola and the members of Hydra waiting him, the members that he once worked with when he was taking down Parker Industries. Zola is eager to continue working with Otto to bring back the glorious return of Hydra, but Otto's a hero now, right? and he wants nothing to do with Hydra. Once one is Hydra, one remains Hydra, and hold death! The Hydra agents open fire, forcing Otto to leap into action, his arms making quick work of the Hydra goons though, leaving only him and Zola until he is struck from behind. Spinning back, he's shocked to see the Gorgon or at least a life model decoy of the villain. The samurai faces against Otto with mechanical arms clashing against katana steel. Even a fake Gorgon is fast though, and one of Otto's limbs is quickly severed. The two trade blows with Otto's arms giving him the upper hand, and eventually one of the bladed tips slashes the ribbon away from Gorgon's eyes. Too late though, as Otto realizes his mistakes, because the Gorgon's eyes are his greatest weapons. Otto tries to react, but he feels his limbs growing heavy as his body turns to stone. By Zola's order, the Gorgon swings his blade, smashing the statue of Otto to pieces, filling the room with the dust of Otto's former body. So end the enemies of Hydra, Zola gloats with Otto's head in his hands. But from the dust, a blade swings, severing the head of the Gorgon. The dust clears, revealing the superior octopus standing with the Gorgon's head clutched in the grip of one of his mechanical arms. Impossible, Zola screams, shock showing on his digitized face. The Hydra members try to stop Otto, a blast of energy shooting from his head cannon. But Otto is too fast, springing across the room on his metal arms. With quick movements, he tears Zola's body to pieces, ridding himself of the enemy. But how did he survive? How has he returned to us, you may be asking yourself? Staring at his cloning machines, which use the technology that he took from the war against the Inheritors during the Spider-Verse. Nothing can stop him now. He is immortal. He is superior. Who can stand against an ever-cloning superior octopus? Well, on Earth-01, known as the Loom World, the Inheritors have heard the signal of their technology. Using the tech from the Spider Army, they begin to send out their own signal, looking for their own escape. On Earth 1048, swipping around the city, Spider-Man's ears are assaulted by the rantings of J. Jonah Jameson over his podcast. 
Why do I torture myself? But that torture quickly ends when Mary Jane calls him instead. It's not a quick call from a girlfriend, though. It seems like the newsroom just got a tip about a spider-themed villain robbing a bank. The last thing Spidey needs is bad publicity, and so he swings into action. Arriving on the scene, Spider-Man is greeted by the Tarantula, a villain armed with mechanical arms. The two begin to fight, and Spidey dodges the Tarantula's arms while using his web bombs on him. Before he can deliver the finishing blow, however, he's interrupted by the superior Spider-Man. Not sure why a second spider-based villain has appeared, the two begin to trade blows. But with a spider sense and heightened agility, keeping the both of them from even touching each other, Spider-Man finally realizes that this man, the superior Spider-Man, is another hero. Unfortunately, this gives the Tarantula just enough time to free himself. Two Spider-Men working together isn't always a good idea, because then the two of them begin to get into each other's ways, becoming trapped in a web bomb. Finally freeing themselves, both Spider-Men retreat to the rooftop so they can finally talk. So the Superior Spider-Man fills in this Peter Parker on the cliff notes as to how we've gotten here. There's alternate realities, there are hundreds of Spider-Men, and there are inheritors. Vampire creatures trying to steal the energy of Spider-People. It's a lot to take in. And the fact that Superior Spider-Man is also actually Otto Octavius is kind of thrown into the mix. But it's nice knowing that in another world, Otto Octavius, the mentor for this Spider-Man, isn't just a villain that betrayed Peter in the past but he does have the ability to become a hero. Peter understands that the spider army needs him, that the inheritors are returning, but he can't just abandon his world. He needs to stop the tarantula. Superior understands and he agrees to help. Catching up with the tarantula, the two Spider-Men work better this time, attacking the villain. Tarantula is well armed though, and the two can't get through his defenses. Luckily, Otto knows a thing or two about mechanical arms, and using his sophisticated spider bots, he overrides the tarantula's mental link with his weapons. With the supervillain defeated, Peter has to make a few stomps, and he checks in with Miles Morales, a friend who has been developing his own set of powers. His girlfriend, Mary Jane, whom he shares a loving embrace with before going off to war. With this taken care of, he joins Otto Octavius, traveling through the multiverse to stop the Spider-Geddon. In Spider-Geddon, the Inheritors have recently risen, and they've begun work on cloning their bodies and raising their father. But Morlun, the Inheritor, leaves on a more personal mission. He chooses to not be a part of the main Spider-Geddon event. Three times has the Spider-Man of Earth 616 beaten him. There shall not be a fourth. The bodies in the ground guide and co-pilot are left at the tarmac in a pool of their own blood as the private jet takes off. Morlun watches over the shoulder of the sweating pilot as the lights of New York near them. Maybe he'll let him live, the pilot probably hopes. The plane begins to plummet with wind rushing through the cabin and over the pilot's limp, dead body as Morlun opens the door. The wind buffets him, whipping through his hair as he leaps out into the night, the city before him. Crashing into the waters below, Marlon begins to make his way to the shore. Elsewhere in the city, though, Spider-Man just finished up capturing a group of bank robbers, quips and webs flying around the room. Walking past the large stacks of money the men have been able to steal, he peers out the window and he's greeted by the red and blue flashes of the police. Hey look, that's my cue! Flipping out the window, he shoots a web and he swings away. Morning, boys. The bad guys are all webbed up for you. You're welcome, he calls to the incoming officers. How about the paperwork, one wonders. As an exhausted Peter swings across the city, the sun begins to peek over the buildings on the horizon, bringing a groan from our hero. If he gets home now, he should have almost a full hour and a half before he has to start his day. I should get a cab. As if on cue, Pete's spider sense begins to kick in, giving him enough time to flip out of the way as the taxi comes sailing through the air. Holy crud! Web shoot out, tying the cab quickly before it can crash and hurt somebody. Pulling the driver clear, his spider sense kicks in again as a mail truck careens towards him. Spider-Man is barely able to stop it before it can crush the taxi driver. As Peter begins to wonder what is causing all of the crazy traffic, more Lun comes strolling down the street. Oh God, is the only thing that he can think of. You have managed to evade me three times before. No more games, today I feed, Spider. The vampire hisses with his eyes glowing red. Spider-Man doesn't hesitate, and despite his exhaustion, he leaps towards the villain. Morlun is fast, however, with his fist coming up to meet Spider-Man's chest. Spider-Man throws a punch, but Morlun easily dodges it with his superior speed. Another blow drops Spidey, drawing blood and tearing his mask at the mouth. 
blood begins to curl from his lips. Morlon doesn't slow down as kicks and punches rain down upon him. Pete needs to get away and he shoots webbing, blinding Morlon, giving him a few precious seconds. The bumper from the taxi acts as a bat as Spidey swings for the fences, but with Morlon down, he doesn't hesitate. Pete runs. He can't lead Morlon back to where he lives, so he calls in some backup. Pulling out his cell phone, he dials the number. Uh, hello? A groggy voice answers. Jonah! Pete yells as he runs, Morlon already on his tail. At his home, Jonah sits up in bed questioning if Peter even knows what time it is. Admitting he doesn't, Pete then asks Jonah for help. He needs something from his apartment and he can't get it himself. Knowing Peter's secret now, Jonah starts getting dressed as he explains where his web watch is in his apartment. Jonah, please hurry. This is pretty serious. You can count on me, Jonah answers as he runs out the door. Hanging the phone up just as Morlun catches up, Peter is tackled from the sky. The two crash into a construction site, with the workers scattering away from the impact. Peter then struggles out of the wreckage, his costume torn, his body broken. Is the whole world bleeding eternally, or is it just me? Enough! Morlun stands above him, a jackhammer in his hands as he plunges towards Peter. But Spider-Man stops the blade inches from his face, gritting his teeth with the strain. Hurry, Jonah. At Peter's apartment, Jonah is pushing past his roommate Randy, moving for Peter's room. How hard could it be to find a watch? Except for the fact that the room is mostly a pile of garbage and broken furniture. Back at the fight, Spider-Man comes crashing through the window of a mattress store, his exhausted body landing on some memory foam. Oh, come on. This isn't fair. He struggles to get up, but the bed is just so comfortable. And he's so tired. He falls back down. Five more minutes. But that's when Morlun steps through the broken window. Spider. All right, I'm up. Pete struggles off the bed with Morlun standing before him. There seems to be no escape, but using his webbing to bring down the ceiling as Morlun lunges, Peter gets a small window of escape once again. Swinging away, he answers his phone as Jonah calls to him, trying to find the watch. Well, to mostly yell at him about how much his room is a mess, but Peter tells Jonah to meet him in Central Park. A line goes dead just as Jonah manages to find the web watch. Later, Jonah is running through the park, calling out to Spider-Man's name. This is insane! I'm never gonna find him! He hops as he catches his breath, but almost on cue, Spider-Man comes falling out of the trees, landing on the ground heavily. You look like drop lasagna! Jonah notes as he surveys Peter's broken body. Specific! He groans. Helping Peter to his feet, Jonah hands him the watch, and Peter orders Jonah to run as he straps it on. But it's too late, and Morlun is rushing at them, his hands gripping Peter's wrist, destroying the web watch that would have allowed him to jump into the multiverse. He falls back as Morlun begins to feed on his life essence. Jonah, watching in horror. Drop him, Morlun! I mean it! Miles orders as he lands in the park. The other spider. The lesser spider. Morlun hisses as he drops Peter, turning and rushing fast into Miles. Pinning him to the ground, Miles tries to use his Venom Strike, but it doesn't seem to have much of an effect on the vampire. He tries again, this time aiming for the creature's eyes. Morlun staggering back with a roar. The momentary blindness was all Peter and Jonah needed. Realizing that his prey has escaped, Morlun moves to chase. Trying to slow him down, Miles shoots some webs, but is punched and thrown away. Further away, Jonah is trying to get Peter to safety, but Pete wants to go back and help Miles. I'm shocked you're able to stand, Jonah tells him. You should see the other guy. Oh wait, you did, and he looked fantastic. Never mind. Stopping on the bridge, Peter takes a second to web his broken arm into a sling. He suddenly slams into Jonah, throwing him off the bridge, just in time as Morlun comes flying in. Grabbing Spider-Man, Morlun leaps away, but Peter struggles free, falling back to the earth. He lands hard again, struggling to his feet to see that he landed at the entrance to the zoo. Moving inside, he slowly tries to get away. Moving through the exhibits, Peter is tired and broken. He just wants to sit down, but he can't. He has to keep moving. He turns, envious of some monkeys that are sleeping in their enclosure. But that's when the answer to stopping Morlun hits him. He moves, trying to find what he needs when Miles comes flipping in. He wants to help Peter defeat the Inheritor, but Peter needs him to go. He needs Morlun to be focused on only him, and he needs Miles to lead the other spiders in stopping the rest of the Inheritors. Following Peter's lead, Miles and Peter web Morlun's feet, springing away. He slips inside of one of the zoo cafes, but they still have to slow down Morlun, so they create a gas leak and turn on the burners. The spiders then both escape out the back as Morlun comes in, the building exploding. Knowing this won't slow down Morlun for long, they keep moving, with Peter finally finding what he needs in a service shed tranquilizers. Miles still does not like the idea of leaving Peter behind, but Pete knows that only Miles can lead the rest of the spiders and stop the inheritors. 
Opening a portal, Miles steps through, leaving Peter with one final word. You got it, Pete. Alone, Pete begins to gear up and outside in the park, Jonah has called in the SWAT team and they're preparing to come in. As Morlon pulls himself from the fiery wreckage of the zoo cafe, Peter loads up on Tranks, now armed with a rifle, pistol, and a bandolier of darts. He cuts his mask to try and cover his face ninja style. He's had enough. Morlun, now dressed in a zoo t-shirt, stalks his prey. From the treetops, Peter gets the vampire in his sights and he fires, the dart hitting Morlun in the neck. Snatching it free, he seems a little more than annoyed. You simpleton, I am an inheritor from a clan of hunters older than time, built to hunt and kill you. Do you think a sedative will slow me down? He screams into the trees. A second dart hits him in the neck. With Peter smiling beneath his mask, he reloads and targets Morlun again. Freeze! The SWAT officers, not knowing what they're getting into, begin to move in on Morlun. The vampire reacts, grabbing the closest officer's arm and snapping it with one movement. Spider-Man leaps in, kicking Morlun free of the officer, and then using another dart, he stabs it into the vampire's neck like a knife. Stay back! I got this! If the sedatives are having any effect, it's not showing. And Morlun throws Spider-Man off of him with ease. The police don't hesitate. They open fire, but the rounds don't even seem to slow Morlun down as he begins to stalk closer. Behind him, Jonah pops out of the bushes, trying to get Peter out of there and let the cops do their job. But Peter knows that if he leaves, Morlun will kill everyone. Telling Jonah to get the cops back, Peter reacts in time to shoot Morlun with another dart before the villain kicks him away. As the police begin to pull back, it's just Spider-Man and Morlun once again. He pulls another dart and moves in fast, stabbing Morlun in the eye. Enraged, the monster kicks the hero away, knocking him into one of the animal enclosures. Pete stands up, seeing a bear staring at him. The animal charges just as Morlun comes in. With a spinning kick, Spider-Man manages to keep both attackers at bay, and a second kick sends the bear into the water, keeping it and Spider-Man safe. Once again, he's alone with Morlun, yet the vampire seems to finally be feeling the effects of the drugs. Tired yet? Peter asks. I don't tire, I feed! Morlun hisses as he attacks, but he's slower. Peter flips over him to attack him back, webbing him and throwing him to the ground. Webbing him up some more, Spider-Man retreats again, hoping to finally end the fight. Snapping the webbing, Morlun follows him into the Penguin Building. Darkness and honking surrounds him, and that's when he sees the spider silhouetted in the doorway. He charges, but Spider-Man moves and Morlun runs headfirst into an animal cage. Morlun roars in anger as the police encircle him. Fire at will, gentlemen. And with these words, the police open fire with trank rounds. The darts all hitting Morlun until he falls, sleeping in a puddle of his own drool. Thanking the police and Jonah for their help, Peter finally manages to get away and he returns to his apartment. He falls into his bed exhausted, his eyes closing as blissful sleep begins to overtake him. Peter! He opens one eye to see Spider-Gwen come swinging in out of another web portal. The inheritors have returned and we need your help! Peter sits up. Tell me on the way. You weren't sleeping, were you? Gwen asks as they step into the portal. Of course not. Not when there's work to be done. High above the streets of New York, Miles Morales is fighting against the Vulturons. Four vulture-suited supervillains that are so laughable, the other Spider-Man doesn't even mention them. Using his venom shock and superior agility, Miles easily stays ahead of the second-rate villains, smashing two of them together. One of the vultures lands amongst a rooftop party. Pulling out a pistol, he waves it at the innocent party goers. You let me go, or you won't be able to tell these losers from the hamburgers that they're cooking! He yells. Miles puts up his hands. It's him that they want. If they let the people go, Miles will even give them a free shot. So the vulture agrees and fires three rounds. With a quick flip of his wrist, he shoots out webs, stopping the bullets, grabbing the vulture. The party goers cheer, but everyone is suddenly shocked when a portal opens up above their heads and leaping out of that portal comes a squad of spider people. They include Spider UK, Spider Ham, Spider Punk, Spider Gwen, Spider Woman, Spider Man Noir, and Octavia Otto. Miles Morales of Earth-616, a crisis of apocalyptic proportions is upon us, Spider-UK calls. Hey Miles, what he's trying to say is, are you busy right now? Spider-Gwen rephrases it. Miles is confused, the last time that the spider army worked together, it was to stop the threat of the inheritors. Are they back? Not yet, but someone is using their tech, Gwen confirms. Who'd be crazy enough to do that? 
Meanwhile, over in San Francisco, Otto Octavius is fighting another B-grade villain, Count Nefaria. The two trade blows for a few moments while trying to explain why one is smarter than the other. Finally being sick of the argument, Count Nefaria uses his laser blast to snap one of the supports on the bridge that they're fighting on. Otto doesn't waste time and using a hologram in his mechanical arms shows Nefaria a video of his family members. My Octobots are poised to kill them. Be gone or your noble lineage ends, Otto demands. Nefaria stares for a moment, and then he laughs. <laughs> I knew your turn as a hero was simply a ruse. Nefaria leaves, vowing to return when Otto returns to his old ways. Returning to his lair, Otto takes sight at his clothing technology, tech that he borrowed from the Jackal and the Inheritors when they faced off in the first Spider-Verse event. He's immortal now. I am superior, he cries out in triumph. Outside, the members of the Spider Army have arrived. While some wonder if they should knock or be worried about traps, Spider UK, who happens to be a mix of Spider-Man and Captain Britain, simply rips the hidden door off. Alarms sound as the group moves quickly through the base. Coming to the cloning tank, Spider-Man Noir prepares a grenade. You dare! Otto yells in the shadows with his ink shooter sticking several spiders to the wall. Otto appears angry that the members of the team that he once fought with would dare attack him. They try to explain that the Inheritors are using his cloning tech to return, but his readouts show that the clones contain his DNA and no one else's. They're wrong, Miles argues. Wrong? I am Otto Octavius, I am never wrong! Spider UK doesn't have time for this, as he, Miles, and Spider Gwen leap into action. The die is cast! Otto cries, and the spiders prepare to fight. Gunfire rips out of Noir. UK destroys one of his arms, and finally Octavia Otto gets through to Otto, showing him that the Inheritors were masking their DNA signatures. There is no time! Leaping forward with his twin 45s, Noir prepares to destroy the tank containing a clone, but he suddenly stopped as a hand and rips through the glass, grabbing him by the face. Morlon has returned, and I see my breakfast awaits. The Inheritor sneers as he begins to feed. Noir doesn't hesitate. He raises those pistols, and he fires into the monster at point-blank range. But the rounds, they do nothing. Eat this! He struggles, firing again into the grenade at his belt. The explosion rips through the room, throwing everyone back. Morlon stands unaffected, his strength returning from his feeding as he throws Spider-Man Noir aside, dead. There's only one inheritor though, and Spider-UK leaps into the fight. Morlon is alone. They can defeat him. As UK is about to throw the winning punch, hands appear from the smoke. Take your hands off my brother. And with a quick jerk, UK's neck is snapped and he falls to the ground lifeless. The spiders stand ready as the second inheritor appears, but Otto is distracted and a third inheritor rips his mechanical arms off from behind. Genix prepares to sink his teeth in, but Otto isn't a totem. The Inheritors are energy vampires built to arrive and suck the life force out of the spider totems, the spider being of a universe. And Otto Octavius, well, he's merely a pretender. With a look of disappointment, Genix throws him aside, and the remaining spiders in the army now find themselves against three Inheritors. Attack! Quickly before they use the cloning tubes to resurrect more of their infernal family! Otto yells and the spiders leap into action. Miles and Mayday Parker attack Verna, webbing up her hands, but she is too strong and she smacks them away like the little insects that they are. Octavius, you're a supervillain! Haven't you got some sort of self-destruct for this place? Gwen questions. Otto is offended. I am a hero now, but yes, of course, I have a self-destruct sequence. And the rest of the spiders fight Verna while Otto and Octavia start the self-destruct sequence. But they can't just leave. They have to make sure that the inheritors are destroyed. Gwen leaps in, kicking Miles free of Verna's grasp. Go, Miles, all of you. I've got this, she orders, but they won't leave her to sacrifice herself. Gwen has a dimensional wristwatch. She'll just warp away at the last second. So as the spiders leave, webbing off the room as they go, Gwen continues to fight, keeping Verna busy while the countdown continues. But Verna is fast, snagging Gwen's arm and pulling her close, and that's what she begins to feed, sucking the life force out of Gwen's body. But Verna doesn't realize that Gwen's powers come from a symbiote now, which reacts in defense to the attack on its host. Startled, Verna pulls back as the tendrils wrap around her throat. Genix, the food is complicated. I fear that I may just have to kill it without a feast. We'll see about that, you Renfair reject! The countdown reaches 10, and the Inheritors realize that they must leave. They heard Gwen's speech about her watch, and they pull one off of the dead spiders at their feet. Verna struggles trying to get Gwen's watch. You'll get this over my dead! Outside, the rest of the spiders watch the building from a distance. Come on, Gwen, get out of there! Miles whispers, and the building explodes before them. 
Maybe she jumped somewhere else. They, they don't know. Otto seems less sad about Gwen's potential death, though, as his Octobots have also picked up the Inheritors, escaping through a dimensional portal. Almost the complete family now wearing steampunk clothing. Verna orders the rest of the family to go find a base while she goes to find their father's spirit. The spider army? Well, they're dismayed to see that she is wearing Gwen's wristwatch. What does this mean? Did Gwen survive? Mayday wants to keep fighting, but Spider-Punk knows that they need more help. Otto deduces that the Inheritors will try to rebuild the clone facilities, which gives them time. So they head to the Jackal's cloning facility at New U. They need to regroup, and opening up a dimensional portal, the team heads to Loom World, the home of the Web of Life and the Destiny. That's where they meet Karn, once a member of the Inheritor family. Karn now watches over the Web, the Web of Life, the thing that ties the multiverse together that all of the spider totems are destined to protect. The group begins to discuss that they are going to need backup. People like Peter Parker and Jessica Drew of Earth-616, or Anya Corazon. Otto disagrees. They do need backup, but not the imbeciles that everyone has mentioned. They need spiders that will not hesitate to put down the Inheritors once and for all. He suggested this last time, but everyone disagreed. The room quickly becomes divided. Spider-Punk and Octavia side with Otto. They need spider individuals who are willing to kill, while Mayday Miles and Spider-Ham are against killing. They will go find individuals who are on their side. Karn puts an end to the fighting, suggesting that both groups pursue their own paths, and destiny will decide who is right. In agreement, the spiders separate, traveling through the portals to find allies. Val thee well, my friends. It has been an honor. Karn whispers to the empty room. Or is it empty? Ah, brother. A voice hisses from the shadows behind him. Verna steps out, mocking her brother for becoming the Master Weaver. It has made him soft. Killing you will be a mercy. I should have done it a millennia ago. She smiles. I could say the same, dear sister. To death, then. Back on Earth-616, Otto, Octavia, and Spider-Punk have arrived at Otto's labs in Horizon University. Spider-Punk doesn't want to waste time, and he portals away to find allies. Realizing this is a war for the spiders, Otto changes from his superior octopus costume. He is once again the superior Spider-Man. The die is cast, he calls. I've always wanted to say that, but I thought people would find it silly, Octavia states. While the other spiders are searching for allies or helping those they've already met, Otto begins to search the multiverse for those who might share his ideals for putting an end to the Inheritors once and for all. Before traveling through the multiverse, though, Otto knows a few people on this Earth who might help them. First, he travels to Las Vegas, reaching out to Kane, the former Scarlet Spider. Kane agrees, but when Otto asks if he has any issues with killing individuals, buddy, I'll enjoy it, he hisses. As they portal away, Ben Riley, the new Scarlet Spider, slips into the portal behind them. Back on Loom World, Karn does battle with Verna, blades from one of his steampunk spider limbs piercing her chest, and he brings her in close, too close. By becoming the keeper of the web of life and destiny, Karn has become a spider totem. Verna drinks his life force, killing him. Now nothing stands in the Inheritor's way. And back on Earth 3109, Spider Gwen awakens. Where am I? She questions, suddenly realizing that her dimensional wristwatch is gone. Later, Otto has enlisted the aid of the Spider-Man of Earth 1048, and the two of them arrived at Earth 51778 to look for one of the most powerful allies. The new Spider-Man is a little new to traveling the multiverse, and he's stunned when he sees the robot Lopardin fighting against a massive kaiju. You know what? I think you should take the lead on this, he quips. Teleporting into Lopardin, Otto gives Takuya, the Spider-Man of Earth 51778, some advice on how to defeat the creature. Lead with the sword, he tells him. Takuya recognizes Otto from the last war with the Inheritors. PS4 Spider-Man waves in greeting. Lead with Sword Vigor? That would be so dishonorable! Sword Vigor is so powerful. Takuya wonders. That's the point. Otto explains that he can destroy his enemies much faster that way. Takuya agrees, launching Sword Vigor, destroying the creature in one blow. While Takuya agrees that it works. If I always fought this way, it'd become boring. Back on Earth 50101, Miles is in Mumbai, recruiting the aid of the Spider-Man of India, Pavater. The two stop some robbers while Miles explains the current situation and how they need the smartest spiders to help. With the crime stopped, they teleport away, and they arrive at their base of operations where they're greeted by their comrades. The team that doesn't want to kill has now recruited Spider-Man and Spinneret of 18119, Spider-Ben and Petey of Earth 91918, and Spider from Earth 14512, and Silk from Earth 616. 
Everyone believes that they need Peter Parker of Earth-616, but he's busy distracting more Lun right now, so they'll have to deal with the other Inheritors themselves. It's not just the Inheritors that we have to worry about. It's also Doc Ock and his band of trigger-happy goons, Spider-Ham points out. Miles believes that they should ask them for help with their attack, but not everyone agrees. The spider forces are spreading thin, with Mayday, Annie, and Anya looking for information about the spider totems. The older Peter Parker from Earth-18119, the Renew Your Vows universe, agrees that they could use the help. Otto has set up their base on Lepardon in Earth-616, and they have now been joined by the Spiders Man, the Spider-Man who's made up of a thousand spiders, the Cowboy Spider-Man of Earth-31913 named Web Slinger, and Norman Osborn Spider-Man of Earth-44145. Otto's forces are also spread thin as he has a strike team led by Kane trying to stop Verna from retrieving the crystal with her father's essence in it. They are surprised by the arrival of Ben Riley, former villain known as Jackal and the new Scarlet Spider. Otto doesn't trust this man as he was the villain at the heart of the clone conspiracy, but Riley informs him that he's just trying to help. Since the Inheritors are trying to use his cloning tech, they might need him. I think you of all people would appreciate the guy with the checkered past trying to make amends, Ben states, pulling off the mask to show his scarred face. Very well, but my gaze shall be upon you, Otto states in a strange former villain fashion. A transmission from Miles' team goes through, and young Petey informs Otto that they are making a strike against the Inheritors at the new U cloning facility. Some of the team want to help, yet Otto believes that if they waste their time and lives on a suicide mission for the other team, it's up to them. At the Inheritor's base, the body of the Inheritor's father has been completed, yet he isn't whole. The body is a completely soulless husk. Unknown to the Inheritors, Spider-Ham has infiltrated the events above them. Breaker, breaker, bacon buddy to head honcho. Recon successful, we're in time. He calls over his radio as he returns to the team. Miles and the rest of the team are waiting. Having placed bombs on all of the support beams, they are simply going to blow this place up and escape. Eliminating the Inheritors cloning abilities in its entirety, preventing them from moving bodies or coming back to life. Everyone back through the portal, I'll go last. I've got to hit the detonator right as I'm leaping through, Miles orders. Suddenly a knife whips out of the shadows by the inheritor known as Bora. The blade slashes across Miles' wrist, forcing him to drop the detonator. The inheritors are now among them, with the spiders fighting to survive. With a slash from inheritor Brix's whip, the detonator is destroyed. He doesn't hesitate and he grabs Miles, beginning to feed off of his life force. Spider, detonate the charges from your suit, Miles orders as he struggles against the vampire. I'll be killing us all, she yells. The others don't know what they're doing. There's no choice. Penny Parker begins to count down. The wall explodes from behind them as the giant tip of sword vigor slices through. Otto's team comes in web slinging with web slinger on a horse. The new team locks into a battle with the inheritors. They deactivated our bombs. We can't leave their equipment intact. Miles tells spider punk. Relax, we got people on that. Deeper in the facility, Otto and his group have used the battle as a distraction. Scarlet Spider begins to destroy the equipment so that it can't be used, while Otto scans the body of Solus, the Inheritor's father, for weaknesses. That's when they're interrupted by Bricks and Bora, who charge at them throwing knives, but instead of fighting, the team retreats with everyone heading into Leparted. With everyone aboard, Leparted begins to transform into the ship Marvelar. This is certainly the strangest spider that we have faced. Bricks quips, trying to get into the mech. And as they get away, everyone seems safe. But Spider Osborn uses his time to quietly speak with Spider's Man about their own plan to trap the Inheritors on 616. In a quiet lab, a portal opens, and Jessica Drew emerges, still clad in her anti-radiation suit. She seems disoriented. In her hands, she holds the soulless crystal, a stone that traps the essence of the Inheritor's father. A clawed hand moves fast, snatching the stone from her, lifting her by the throat. Our dear sister Verna has sent us a gift, Jenix snarls, his fangs displayed in a grin. Jessica tries to struggle, but she is thrown away. When Deimos quickly tries to feed off of her, though, he is weakened. Jessica received her powers from a radiation blast, and radiation poisons the inheritors. This is good news for Jenix, though. They can study her DNA and learn how to eliminate the weakness to radiation that they inherently have. Yet, there is time for that later. With a smile of triumph, Jenix places the crystal into the machine with Solus's body. A growl issues from their father's throat as Solus finally awakens. I live! I live! He cries, maniacal laughter filling the room. His children all bow before him. 
But back with our heroes, the spiders have taken up a field trip in Earth-13. The place where the spider army first fought the Inheritors looks like a battlefield. And erected there is a statue of this world's Spider-Man. A spider that had combined with the powers of Captain Universe. Yet this still was not enough, and he fell to Solus. Otto Octavius has brought everyone here so that they may analyze the powers cosmic, so that he may find it in their own universe. Spider Norman believes that this is a waste of time, and some of the team begins to bicker about their next course of action. A portal opens up, and Spider Punk pops his head out, interrupting the conversations. Guys, we really gotta get back to the base. I got some bad news. Back at Lepardon, the giant robot and mech Spider-Man, Octavia gives the team the bad news. Solus has awakened. Spider Norman doesn't believe that it matters. They need to stop putting their hopes on things like Captain Universe and come up with a plan. That is enough, Otto states. Otto, who is also known as Superior Spider-Man, has changed his mind and the team does not require the help of Norman Osborn anymore. The rest of the spiders agree, regardless of whether they agree with Otto on the way to stop the inheritors. And the room stands against Norman. I'll just go back to my world and work on a real solution, Osborn states, opening up a portal. He offers Spider's man a chance to join him. And the creepy hero that is actually made up of millions of little spiders that believe themselves to be Peter Parker accepts. The web watch, Osborne. I will not have you gallivanting across dimensions causing trouble. Otto orders, and Norman Osborne tosses back the device. Wouldn't dream of it. Have fun storming the castle, idiots. And with this insult, Norman is gone. The team goes back to their planning, with Otto believing that they have all the brute strength, the Lepardon and sword vigor, the weapon of Lepardon. Miles doesn't think so, though, and he wants to bring in more spider individuals, more allies. The two compromise. Otto will come up with a plan. The unneeded spiders will gather more allies. But Norman and Spider's man, they did not go home. They have arrived on Loom World. Norman once saw it through a cosmic cube, and all they find is the body of Karn, the former inheritor and the former Loom Weaver. Spider's man sends out some of his little spiders making a meal of Karn, and Norman ignores him, slicing off a piece of the web of life and destiny. With the web of life and destiny, I can go anywhere. But with all of these web watches out there, someone will stomp us. Reaching into another dimension, Norman Osborn pulls forth a can of radioactive material. But what if the web of life did not exist? Back on the pardon, Miles is running down a list of new potential spider individuals to join their battle against the Inheritors. One is a giant red T-Rex, and one is a grizzled cop with a mustache. A spider cop. Spider cop exists? I can't express how happy this makes me. PS4 Spider-Man whispers. Suddenly, everyone's web watches short circuit and deactivate. Moments earlier on Loom World, Spider's man has separated himself and gone into different dimensions. Norman, too, steps through a portal, and at the last second, he presses a switch on his detonator, destroying the web of life behind him. Back on the part of the spiders realize that they are now trapped, and without their web watches, they can't see into the other worlds. They can't travel. Some have children that they've left behind. Someone trapped the inheritors on World 616 with them. Miles tries to calm everyone down. We're gonna get through this, together guys. Otto, he says turning, but the superior Spider-Man has disappeared, and Scarlet Spider, Ben Riley, with him. Otto and Ben have arrived in the lair of the Inheritors, slipping quietly inside with Otto wanting to make sure one more time that Riley will not betray him. Don't worry, I'll do my part, Riley states as he turns away from Otto. Then so will I! Otto declares with one of his mechanical spider arms slicing down on Riley's back, knocking him unconscious. He picks him up, and he moves forward. I have fulfilled my bargain. Show yourselves, inheritors. His enemy stands before him, and Otto Octavius offers Ben Riley as a sacrifice. I must admit, we were intrigued by your offer, Genix smiles, taking Riley. Once he absorbs the life force, he will know all he needs to know about this universe's cloning equipment. Otto cares nothing for the inheritors, just hold up their end of the bargain and spare 616. I agree to your terms. We will show this world mercy. Though they made no promises as to those that would interfere with their work. Otto turns away as the vampires descend upon Scarlet Spider. Back upon the pardon, Miles has sent a message out to the Enigma Force, the power of Captain Universe, and they have gotten a response. Who dares summon Enigma Force? It bellows across the room. The Enigma Force is not a tool to be manipulated by mortals. The Enigma Force comes to those it deems worthy. What arrogance makes you think that you are worthy? The energy seems to have washed over the room, and one by one the spiders realize their failures in life. And it is finally Miles who speaks up. Now, you know what? Maybe we're not worthy. None of us. But who is? Miles yells at the mysterious cosmic power. 
We're trying to save the multiverse, and if that's not good enough, then go away! The energy flares filling the room with red light. Ah, Miles, perhaps we should not antagonize the cosmic force. The Indian Spider-Man observes. Back at the Inheritor's base, Otto begins to leave before the monster's feet. I can't believe you did this, Otto. A voice hisses from the rafters. Otto turns, and he tells him, Silence! They'll hear you! PS4 Spider-Man followed him, and he leaps to attack their betrayer. A quick web bomb sticks Otto to the wall, and PS4 turns as he senses the Scarlet Spider in danger. Then Riley's vision begins to blur as he wakes up, his eyes focusing, and he stares into the face of a monster. Genix begins to feed on his life force, gaining his knowledge as well. Yet knowledge is not all that Ben Riley has locked away in his mind. Memories of his 27 deaths and resurrections at the hands of the Jackal, causing the shattering of his mind, which is also passed to Genix. I'm dying! Again and again, I'm dying! Genix screams as insanity overtakes his mind. PS4 then realizes Otto's plan, but before the two of them can make up and, you know, get along, the inheritors are upon them. Solus's sheer strength forces them back. Trying to gain the upper hand, the two are knocked into one another. They are no match for the Inheritors, and Solus stands over them. I claim this kill. From behind, he is hit with a powerful cosmic blast, though. Turning, they see the spiders led by Miles Morales, now with the power of Captain Universe. Solus and Cosmic Miles lock into combat, with Solus trying to get close with his brute strength, but Miles plays it smart. He keeps him at a distance. Even with all of his powers, Solus seems to be shrugging off each blast. Outside, Lepardon is flying in to join the fight. The windshield shatters inward as Deimos leaps through. He stands over to Koya. I told you that I'd feast upon your meat. Lepardon is dangerous, so Deimos will stop him now. You think Lepardon is the one to fear? I am an emissary of hell. Face me, villain, and learn what that means, Sequoia yells. In the distance, Spider watches as Lepardon crashes out of the sky. Leaping to her teammate's aid, Penny Parker finds Demo struggling from the wreckage. Back inside, the spiders have met the inheritors in battle, and taking this moment, Otto grabs Octavia and the two of them slip away. Otto has a plan, and Octavia finds one of their allies, freeing Jessica Drew. The battle rages on even now, in that direction, but we have a different mission, Otto states, and without hesitation, Jessica runs off to join the fight. Otto's plan is simple, to right a wrong. The spiders are losing. With Cosmic Miles fighting Solus, the rest do not have the strength to defeat the Inheritors. Older Peter Parker and Spinneret MJ from the Renew Your Vows universe share one last kiss, hoping that their daughter, Annie Mae, will be all right. But that's at the exact moment that we hear. Mom, Dad, we talked about being gross in public. Annie Mae, their daughter of Earth 18119, yells as she comes through a portal with Mayday and Spider Girl. It turns out that the three young spider women are actually the pattern makers. And they move straight out of the power Rangers, the three women suddenly power up wearing spider armor from the web of life and destiny. With this added strength, the battle continues, and the spiders now stand a chance. The battle rages on, spider against energy vampire. With Mayday attacking Deimos, her heart set on the revenge of the death of her father in the previous war. The Spider-Verse! Bricks and Bora are bleeding, with Jenix fighting a mad rage, his mind now broken. Still, it might not be enough. Miles continues his fight with Solus, trying to stay ahead of the monster. Suddenly, another portal opens, and more spiders emerge, led by Spider-Gwen and Peter Parker, from Earth 616. Seeing his friend, Miles renews his assault, combining his Venom Strike with the Power Cosmic and throwing Solus across the room. Peter 616 wants to help, but he doesn't have the strength to take down Solus. He has been beaten down by Morlun, and if you're interested in that story, we put that video out two weeks ago. Swinging away, he goes to find Otto, who now stands with the resurrected Ben Riley. We have to kill the Inheritors. You can persuade the others, Otto states, but Peter will never condone killing. And that's when Otto reveals the plan to him. Okay, this sounds actually interesting, Otto. Using their comms, Peter orders the rest of the spiders to follow Otto's lead. Suddenly, behind Solus, they stand. Hey, Solus, I'm back and I got two words for you. Miles quips, Sword Vigor! He yells, throwing a massive mecha blade, piercing Solus and throwing him into the wall. You're supposed to cross your arms when you say it, Takoya informs him. Notes later, please! The rest of the inheritors leap to the defense of their father, but the rest of the spiders quickly pile onto them, webbing them down, holding them for a time. Later, Otto's plan has worked. Long ago, the inheritors were mutated and turned into monsters by their father. Otto has now transferred their consciousness into clone babies. Without the memories of their past and no father to change them into monsters, they have been given a second chance at life. Now they just need someone to adopt them.
Luckily, among the crowd is a friendly elderly woman who goes by the name of Spider Ma'am. She thinks that her husband and nephew will love to have the children. With the crisis over, the Enigma Force leaves Miles' body, flying off to wherever it comes from. The rest of the spiders return to their worlds. Despite their differences, Miles and Otto have at least come to an agreement. If he ever needs help, Miles will be there for the superior Spider-Man. Meanwhile, somewhere in a dark lab, Spider Norman stares at a piece of the web of life and destiny that he took, and he smiles. And there you have it, today's full story. I hope you guys enjoyed. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell right here on this channel, as it will only ever be receiving full stories from the other channel. And if you want to see the videos as they come out, make sure you go check out the Comic Story and Main channel, where you get five days of videos a week. I'll see you next time.